Hi, I'm Michael Jura from HRL Laboratories. Today, I'm going to be talking about reduced disorder and opportunities for scalable two-dimensional gate array design using the Sledge architecture and silicon-silicon germanium exchange-only qubits. This new architecture we call Sledge is a significant change from how we and much of the community used to fabricate qubits. Previously, we employed a liftoff overlapping gate architecture, which constrained quantum dots to rings or two parallel rows of dots. Now, in Sledge, we separately fabricate gates and interconnects. This will enable future designs where we can imagine multiple rows of quantum dots or 2D arrays of gates enabled by these back-end interconnects. Let me first give quick background on the intended application, silicon-silicon-germanium exchange-only qubits. Electrons are confined to a silicon quantum well in silicon germanium underneath the surface of the semiconductor. One qubit is encoded with three electrons, each in its own quantum dot, defined by surface metal gates. One qubit requires three quantum dot gates and also two exchange gates in between. These exchange interactions end up looking like rotations around two different axes in a block sphere representation of the qubit. There are benefits related to decoherence and all electrical control, but there is overhead we pay. We need more quantum dots for every qubit. So the challenge is we need to get good at fabricating quantum dots. Our solution was what we termed SLEDGE, which stands for Single Layer Etched Defined Gate Electrodes. We can finally design whatever front end of line surface gate geometry we want and use the back end of line to connect it to the outside world in a different step. The benefits that I'm going to tell you about include reduced disorder because the subtractive front end allows for aggressive cleans before gate stack. We see this reduced disorder in quantum dot loading voltages and also hall transport. I'll also show you one of the possible problems. If vias are not electrically well connected to gate metal, the gate acts as its own quantum dot. But this can be solved through process optimization. And while not the focus of this talk, to cut to the chase, these sledge devices do produce high-performance exchange-only qubits. My colleagues will be talking in further depth about these, but they include one qubit randomized benchmarking at the 99.9% .9 fidelity level and two qubit at 97.1% fidelity. Next, I'll describe the sledge process flow. First, we start with a silicon-silicon germanium heterostructure where the silicon quantum well is about 30 to 80 nanometers below the surface. Next, we perform a high-dose phosphorus implant in regions termed end well. Not shown, we implant argon in regions that are electrically isolating. Then, with the active regions of the device exposed, we can thoroughly clean the surface and deposit the gate stack. This aggressive pre-cleaning is one of the reasons for reduced disorder. In this case, we use a gate dielectric of aluminum oxide, hafnium oxide, and gate metal of tin nitride. We then subtractively etch away the gate metal where we don't want it using both optical and E-beam lithography. This defines the individual gates of the device. After that, we deposit an etch stop layer hafnium oxide, which will be used later, and then a thicker inner layer dielectric silicon oxide. Finally, we complete a dual damascene back end. In the inner layer dielectric, we etch vias, then trenches. Then we can use ALD tin nitride to fill these and finally, a chemical mechanical polish to remove tin nitride on the ILD surface. This isolates trench lines, which we call M1 routing for metal layer 1. We then term the vias via 01 because they route between M1 and the gate stack. Here are top down SE images of various two qubit devices. The geometry is that there are six quantum dot gates separated by five exchange gates. Underneath each qubit is a charge sensor made by one quantum dot gate with two tunnel barrier gates. Leading to either side of these charge sensors are bath gates, which funnel in conductive two-dimensional electron gas from ohmic contacts to the outside world. Gating all other regions into depletion are gates we call field gates, which can be either the inner field gate or outer field gate. You'll see three different geometries shown here. Because of the separated front end, we have flexibility in their design. Here is an example of a six dot device where we can tune to one electron in each dot. We show the double dot charge stability diagrams corresponding to each exchange gate in between each pair of dots. Next, I'll show measurements of reduced disorder using sledge. The first comes from examining statistics of plots of dot loading voltage VP 
versus tunnel gate, or equivalently exchange gate voltage, Vx, as a metric for when we have tuned different devices to the same potential landscape at the quantum well, we choose this point marked with a yellow cross, which is when we can first start to resolve loading of the first electron. Because our experiments all use similar lock in frequencies and data acquisition rates, this point represents a standard tunnel rate from a quantum dot with a standard trapping potential, able to hold just one electron. In order to correct for any DC offsets from the field gates, we look at the difference in P minus X voltage and pool the variance across the device. This latter pooling by device allows us to look at different gate geometries with different P and X gate sizes, because it's only the variation in P minus X across a device that we are concerned about. You can see in the plot at the right that when we collect these statistics for different processes, sledge has a much lower standard deviation than the traditional liftoff process. Optimized sledge includes more aggressive claims, but it does not show a statistically significant improvement over unoptimized, indicating something else, such as disorder in the gaps between gates is dominating this within-device variation. Next, I want to show disorder metrics from Hallbar measurements. In our fabrication, at every metal deposition step of a qubit device, we also make a Hallbar. Our measurement disorder metric is the linearly extrapolated density at which mobility goes to zero, and we call this n-min, though there are a few other names of this. It is very similar to a percolation density or metal insulator transition density. We found that the advantage of this linear fit n-min is that it is quickly measured and repeatable. You can see from the n-min statistics at the right that sledge has a lower n-min than the traditional liftoff process. Further, here we see that the optimized, better clean sledge devices have lower n-min than unoptimized sledge devices. These reductions in disorder help with in-device tune-up, calibration, and software automation of these steps, which is something that HRL is pursuing and my colleagues will be detailing in other talks. Next, I'd like to briefly comment that with this backend interconnect capability, you can really imagine 2D arrays of gates. They would just require routing up to additional backend levels. These figures show a schematic for such a design we nickname a 2x3 because it has two rows of three dots. To connect to the middle row of dots would require routing up to another level of backend metal. M2 and vias to connect up via 1, 2. So the back end opens up a lot of possibilities. But I want to show one problem we've observed. The via may only form a tunnel contact with the gate metal below. The gate metal acts as a metallic quantum dot. And because this is a device failure, we term it a parasitic metal dot. This cross section on the left shows the problematic interface of where the etched via needs to contact the disk of gate metal. In the middle is an electrical schematic, again indicating that the disk of gate metal may form its own quantum dot with discrete numbers of charges on it. On the right is a charge stability plot, which shows the traditional quantum dot anti-crossing. Superimposed in the background is a grid, which is due to each metal gate, P2 and P3 in this case, charging up themselves. You can see that the addition voltage of these PMDs is about 2 millivolts, which is much smaller than the semiconductor quantum dot we want which is more like 40 millivolts. Usually, we think that the addition voltage of a dot, classically, looks something like the electron charge divided by the capacitance between the gate and the dot. Here, because the gate is the source of the electron, the addition voltage actually looks like the electron charge divided by the capacitance from the dot to everything except the metal gating it, which in this case is the via. We can come up with rough arguments for how this capacitance of the isolated gate metal should scale with its geometry. And indeed, data on PMD addition voltages shows these trends. Because this is a device failure, we need a way to reduce PMD rates. Next, I want to show some of our process optimization that has led to success. First, on the left, we found that our 40 Kelvin wafer prober was able to measure test structures that were very predictive of the prevalence of PMDs on qubit devices once cooled down to 1.6 Kelvin or below. These test structures are simply four-wire via resistance measurement structures, and their 40 Kelvin resistance can vary significantly. By using this 40 Kelvin wafer prober, we were able to rapidly feed back on fabrication improvements. One variation we tried was moving from a dual damaging backend to subtractive. Very briefly, with subtractive processing, the steps are to etch vias, ALD fill immediately, and then subtractively pattern M1 lines on top of the ILD. With our tool set, we found that this was able to drastically reduce the PMD rate, 
which we attribute to better cleaning of the etched via directly before fill. Again, a PMD is a device failure, so driving this as close to zero as possible was important. Finally, I want to preview again that indeed these devices can be used for coherent control of electron spin. Here's a device where singlet-triplet exchange oscillations are shown for each of the five exchange axes. This is not a hero device. Getting five functional exchange axes is common in these devices. Finally, I'll wrap up with a few summary points. We've shown a new architecture for fabricating exchange-only qubits. The benefits include reduced disorder and the ability to design different gate geometries, including scaled 2D arrays of gates. I showed the electrical signature of a possible problem, PMDs, and we were able to drive their rate to near zero with process improvements. Finally, I do want to highlight that these devices do indeed make good high-performance exchange-only qubits, which other colleagues from HRL will be detailing.